A strange, unexplained phenomenon grips the quiet town of Midwich, changing the lives of the female residents. Inside a house, a man named Sam packs things into a suitcase with his partner, Zoe. A military vehicle passes by their street, and when all is clear, they hurriedly run to their car. However, they see their daughter, Hannah, walking toward them. They freeze as Hannah asks Zoe what she's done. Five years earlier, a young Sam and Zoe drive through the woods to their new home in Midwich. Mary Ann, a real estate agent, calls to say they can get their keys. Meanwhile, a little girl named Charlotte introduces her stuffed toys while Dr. Susanna, a family therapist, listens intently. Charlotte fears something bad will happen if she loses one of her toys, but Susanna reassures her that she can leave one toy behind while spending time with her grandparents. Charlotte hesitates but leaves the lion. Susanna watches as Charlotte and her mom, Sarah, leave. Then she calls her daughter, Cassie, but gets ignored, so she reminds the girl she's going to London that night. Cassie nonchalantly points out that Susanna is going on a date, but Susanna just ignores her remark. Elsewhere, Marianne hands the house keys to Sam and Zoe and tells them to enter the front door backward for good luck. A framed newspaper cutout catches Zoe's attention, Midwich is one of the best places to bring up children. On the ride to their new home, the couple is blissful and relishes their new environment. When they reach their house, Zoe enters backward and marvels at the experience. However, Sam doesn't do the same, so Zoe teases him. At the same time, Cassie's TV experiences glitches. Concurrently, a woman named Jane sits by the window, overlooking a field where children are playing. A guy arrives and invites her to do night duty, and Jane agrees to do so after she picks up her dog, Tilly. When she says thanks, Jane quietly mocks his tone. Across Midwich, birds and horses are deeply disturbed. Static jumps across power lines. While in a cab, Jody notices the traffic lights going haywire and warns the driver just before he hits pedestrians. Jody turns up at her sister Deborah's front steps, and as Jody enters, Deborah makes a face. After having her invitation to drink turned down by her pregnant sister, Jody complains about the incident she experienced on the road. Deborah jokes that Midwich probably wants to keep Jody out of town, but she just scoffs. While Sam and Zoe unpack, their blonde neighbor, Rachel, watches them from the window. She and her husband, Curtis, joke about the other couple's origins. Zoe goes upstairs and calls her mom and reassures her that she chooses Sam all while she's listening from below. As soon as the call ends, Zoe spots a wall with kids' drawings. Zoe and Sam continue unpacking when suddenly, the lights flicker. Everywhere in Midwich, devices go haywire until they turn off. In the police station, DCI Paul Haynes receives updates about the intermittent power supply, but no faults can be found. Unfortunately, they have no idea what it could be. Suddenly, Paul receives a call from Deborah informing him about Jody's situation. She and her partner, Steve, broke up for good. Because Jody's already drinking, Deborah thinks she might stay the night, and an exasperated Paul sighs but calls it a good idea. Thanks to reports, he'll stay late. Before hanging up, Deborah says, I love you, but Paul hesitates. Then, Deborah ends the call. Meanwhile, Susanna smokes. She then gives Cassie instructions, and Cassie just compliments her appearance and hopes her date is worth it. Although hesitant about leaving Cassie alone, Susanna kisses her and leaves before she misses the train. At the doorway, Susanna looks back, and Cassie calls her, but Susanna slowly leaves. Just as Susanna arrives at the train station, Amrita departs and gets in a car with Stuart behind the wheel. Arriving home, Stuart tells Amrita that his family's away for the weekend. Stuart dismisses the idea of a hotel as they'd look guilty, but Amrita retorts they are guilty. To Stuart, however, they are just having a campaign meeting, and then they kiss. At the stables, the horses are still neighing wildly. A young lady named Nora is on call agreeing to join a house party. When she hangs up, she checks on a horse and tries soothing it. That night, Jane checks the room and sees a kid named George still hunched over his bed, calling his attention so he'd sleep. In their new home, Sam and Zoe are eating and reminiscing their memories. Knowing he listened to her and her mom's conversation, Zoe affirms that she's choosing Sam. They clink glasses and toast to new beginnings, then Zoe starts removing her clothes. From the window, Rachel is still spying on them. Nora walks to the party and finds people jamming to their headphone music. She too walks to a corner and plays her own music. While Deborah is cooking dinner, Jody talks about her stable life. She admires Deborah for having a great house and a decent man, saying she knows Paul makes her happy. Deborah reassures Jody that she'll have a stable life too, and in response, Jody whispers to Deborah's belly and calls her baby Lucky. Afterward, they hug. In her dark house, Cassie walks and finds Charlotte's toy lion. Suddenly feeling upset, she walks away and sees the TV glitching again. Deeply uncomfortable, she hurries outside and calls someone before running away. Around town, things are unfolding quickly. Sam and Zoe are making love, the horses manage to free themselves and gallop away, and Cassie sees malfunctioning traffic lights and looks horrified. 
Once the power is back on, Sam and Zoe are exposed, laughing while hurrying up upstairs. Jody wonders what's happening as Deborah discovers the lights won't turn off. Deborah leaves a voicemail for Paul. In the prep school, Jane also notices the lights won't turn off. Then she spots George standing still and looking at her blankly. As Jane approaches him, a bright light comes down from the sky and fills the school hallway. Cassie walks blankly and sees a horse galloping toward her. Then she collapses. Around town, everyone else collapses too, both humans and animals. During her date, Susanna listens to Michael talking about his ex-wife. She asks about Michael's children too, then she shares her experiences as a family therapist. Michael is flattered that Susanna went to London for a date, but to Susanna, dating someone from Midwich might bring her near to her patients. Michael invites her to walk through the city with him and asks for more time together, but Susanna declines because she has to look after Cassie. He makes an insensitive comment, prompting Susanna to end the night. Before she leaves, she advises him to work on unresolved issues with his ex-wife. Later, as Susanna calls and leaves Cassie a voicemail at the train station, she learns the trains aren't running thanks to the power interruption. She then tries calling Cassie again before deciding to hail a cab. Little Charlotte wakes to the sound of news about hearing nothing from Midwich residents affected by the blackout. Charlotte's mother reassures her that her dad is going to be fine. When Susanna nears Midwich, she tries to contact Cassie again. However, she finds the roads are closed and there's no way through. She alights and asks the police, but she is instructed to head to Warham Village Hall and wait there. Even using her daughter's illness as an excuse doesn't grant her entry. Instead of turning around, Susanna decides to sneak past the police through a dark street. Reaching Midwich, she calls Cassie but still hears nothing. Then, she sees a group of people wearing protective suits and an unconscious body lying on a field. When one man in a suit approaches the body too close, he faints. Someone spots Susanna, so she runs away, but she collapses too. As Paul reads his text to Deborah, a London agent, Bryani, arrives. He briefs her, the situation is centered around the prep school and everyone entering falls unconscious. Bryani wonders what that means, and in response, Paul hands her a folder showing bodies. Not even drones can pick anything. Just then, someone informs Paul of an unconscious body. When they arrive in Midwich, they see Susanna, who's regained consciousness. Asked about her experience, Susanna recounts she felt lightness, dizziness, and a sense of quiet. As Susanna is informed she'll be sent for tests, she says she wants to see her daughter, but Paul denies her entry. Briani and Paul stand by the card in line, and she asks if he heard anything from his wife. Pulling out his phone, Paul plays Deborah's voicemail about lights remaining on before the recording glitched. The next morning, Susanna sits worried as the news reports nothing new. Briani and Paul arrive to meet John, a special operations commander who'll take over the situation. John dismisses Paul's recommendation for a phased evacuation before returning to the operations area. Instead, John orders a chopper to take off. When Briani asks Paul why he's staring intently, he mutters they shouldn't have done that. As the chopper flies closer to Midwich, they confirm signal blockages. The chopper is instructed to approach, and they spot bodies. But then the pilots lose consciousness, causing the chopper to crash and explode. Paul walks out and tries to contact Deborah, but he can't reach her. He reveals to Briani that Deborah is pregnant, and she reassures him they'll get her out. Phased evacuation occurs, and Susanna asks an officer about the full evacuation. Seeing Sarah, Susanna informs her about the evacuation. Sarah reveals she can't contact her husband, Stuart, and is getting worried. The military instructs them about the evacuation, but Susanna is determined to wait until she hears news about Cassie. When she walks away, a soldier stops her, and an altercation ensues. Paul arrives in time and orders everyone to stand down. Then, Susanna receives a call from Cassie. Just waking up, Cassie looks for Susanna and says she needs her, so Susanna reassures her daughter. Around Midwich, everyone regains consciousness. Everyone's phones start ringing as well. Zoe wakes up with no clothes on and hurriedly looks for Sam, who is wounded. At home, Stuart awakens and picks up a call from Sarah. She's relieved to hear from him and says the police are on the way. Beside him, Amrita wakes up, but Stuart wants her gone. In the police station, Paul stays to coordinate units. Learning that Paul still hasn't heard from Deborah, Briani offers to check on his wife. As she goes through town, everyone is disoriented. Finally, Briani arrives at Paul's house, but no one hears the doorbell. She walks around and finds the back door, and the stench of gas meets her. Jody lies unconscious, but Briani manages to wake her. As soon as she puts Jody outside, she looks for Deborah and finds her lying in the kitchen. Briani turns the gas off and discovers Deborah has no pulse. Despite performing CPR, she realizes Deborah's dead. Later from the window, Jody watches as Deborah's body gets taken away. Paul arrives, but unfortunately, he's too late. Charlotte and Sarah arrive home, hugging Stuart, who looks guilty and shaken. Jane walks outside to the field with Tilly, and she puts her hand on her stomach and breathes deeply. Zoe does so too, looking at Sam while smiling. Jody also puts a hand on her stomach. 
Susanna eventually reunites with Cassie and hugs her. She apologizes, but Cassie assures her she's okay. At the same time, Cassie touches her stomach. Susanna sadly looks at Cassie and embraces her daughter again. Two months after the incident, everyone tries to return to normalcy. Nora trains a kid in horseback riding, but the child falls off as the horse runs amok. Then, Nora feels her stomach. Paul stands in front of the mirror and is haunted by Deborah's words. He sighs and arranges a 2pm meeting in the car later and lets London know about it. Cassie washes the dishes and she and Susanna exchange looks. As Paul sits in the car, he hears Deborah saying she loves him. Finally, he spots Jody and talks to her about police business. When they go to Jody's apartment, he learns that she and Steve got back together. Paul brings up the blackout again, and though Jody doesn't want to talk about it anymore, he presses for the particular reason why she's back with Steve. As it turns out, Jody's pregnant, and Paul knows about it. Jody wonders how Paul knew, and he replies they need to talk about it. Sam and Zoe arrive cheerfully at the hospital for a pregnancy checkup, and they're led to a wing. Sam worries, but Zoe assures him she can feel life growing inside her. Once they reach the wing, they find a room full of people. As they get inside, the government's medical advisor, Colin, speaks about the tests they've conducted, saying all women of childbearing age got pregnant during the blackout. Everyone grows concerned and gets upset, and Zoe asks if they all got pregnant the same way. Unfortunately, Colin admits they need to conduct more tests. But thanks to the information they have, Paul says they've concluded that the blackout was the date of conception. Sam and Zoe attempt defiance, but Paul says he can direct them on what to do. Due to the Midwitch blackout being considered a red-level threat, they have to sign the official Secrets Act. As Sam and Zoe attempt to leave again, Curtis points at a camera. Paul admits they received extrajudicial powers from the Home Secretary, leaving everyone shocked. When Zoe tries calling a lawyer, she finds the signal is jammed. Soldiers show up and guard the door, preventing them from leaving. To break the tension, Susanna chimes in and asks Paul to get the soldiers outside. She stands and recounts how she doubted Cassie's story of not knowing how she got pregnant until other women raised similar concerns. If every woman in the zone got pregnant, Susanna thinks something must have happened. Zoe tries denying this, but Marianne speaks up too. Despite not having any encounters for years, she's suddenly pregnant. The only reason Sarah and Susanna didn't get pregnant was that they were out of town. Just then, some young women who also got pregnant at the house party arrive. Paul asks for Susanna's help to get them to sign the secrecy paper. So, Susanna says everyone is free to sign if they wish, but they have to accept that May 6th happened. Susanna says she'll sign and invites everyone to join her. One by one, the people follow suit. Zoe sits there for a while, dumbfounded. In the hospital later, the women get tested. Zoe learns they're testing the fetus's DNA for any signs of the father's DNA. Meanwhile, Susanna stares as Cassie gets an ultrasound. Afterward, Paul finds a smoking Susanna outside and leads her to Bernard, a higher up in the home office. Briony informs Susanna they're locating all affected women and asks for her psychological expertise to guide them throughout their pregnancy journey, regardless of whether they choose to keep the baby or not. Sensing Susanna's hesitation, Bernard reminds her they're dealing with public safety. Then, Susanna agrees with his sentiment. Before Susanna leaves, Briony approaches her to ask questions about Cassie. Paul drives Jody back to his house, and she endures seeing the place. Upstairs, Jody tells Paul she'll keep the baby and asks him to understand. As Paul leaves, Jody checks the closet full of baby clothes, and she grieves again. Paul hears Jody, but just goes outside. That night, Susanna talks to Cassie, and the girl mockingly asks if that is her free therapy session. Cassie confides that her pregnancy makes sense, as though she was visited. Concerned, Susanna asks if Cassie is ready to keep the baby. Sadly, Cassie argues with Susanna because she thinks Susanna doesn't believe she's mother material, eventually leaving the room. The next day, Zoe's on the phone when Sam gets home. She tells him about the test results, saying there's no paternal DNA. Since Sam isn't the legal father, they must sign something to ascribe legal rights to him. Breaking down, Zoe wants to terminate her pregnancy. But Sam convinces her that it's their best shot at pregnancy, reminding her that their doctor gave them less than a 1% chance before and begging her not to get rid of the child. Concurrently, Susanna is busy talking to Jane while Cassie reads a letter about the termination service at the hospital. At home, Zoe informs her mom about the baby. Marianne is talking to Sarah about the pregnancy when Charlotte asks Stuart who's messaging him, but he just lies. As it turns out, it's Amrita admitting she missed two periods. Cassie finally decides to get rid of the child, arriving at the hospital and telling the nurse she just wants it to be over. While waiting, she sees Nora, who confides that her friend got arrested for posting the incident on social media. Rachel arrives too, to terminate her pregnancy. When Cassie gets called, she's asked routine questions and is informed she'll receive two pills. Then, all three women are asked to stay in the holding room to sign the consent form. As they attempt to sign, the lights suddenly flicker. They drop their pens in unison and leave together as though dazed. 
Brayani watches from the security feed and informs Paul that the same thing happened again. Five months later, the women's bellies have grown large. Marianne still works in real estate while Rachel is excited about her child. Brayani is watching them when a soldier hands her a report. Susanna reads her therapy entry and notes that the strange situation brings most of the women together. At the train station, Zoe finds herself unable to board the train. She looks at her tummy and realizes the baby has something to do with it. As the train leaves, she calls Susanna. She arrives at Susanna's place and learns Cassie and Nora are there too. Nora asks Cassie what name she'll give her child, and she says Eve. Then Cassie's belly suddenly moves. While grocery shopping, Mary Ann finds Jody, and they strike up a conversation. Mary Ann offers a place Jody can rent, and Jody thinks it's a lovely idea. As Nora leaves, she recalls her mom's comment that her belly looks unnaturally big, despite having six more weeks to go. Meanwhile, Zoe admits she suspects the baby controlled her body at the train station. Back in the grocery store, Jody suddenly feels pain, and her water breaks as the lights flicker. Marianne remembers the baby might come out early and walks with Jody, but she too experiences the same thing. Cassie interrupts Susanna and Zoe and asks if they've seen the Midwitch chant group, because several mothers have begun giving birth. Then, like clockwork, Cassie and Zoe's water break too. In the hospital, all the women are in labor. Thankfully, they survive the ordeal and cradle their babies excitedly, except for Zoe, who eyes her child suspiciously. That night, Paul watches over Jody's baby as it sleeps soundly. But when he walks away, all the babies in the ward open their eyes, glowing gold in the dark. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.